Chapter One of Robin Hood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Robin Hood by Paul Creswick. Chapter One. Well, Robin, on what folly do you employ yourself? Do you cut sticks for a fire of mornings? Thus spoke Master Hugh Fitzooth, King's Ranger of the Forest at Locksley, as he entered his house. Robin flushed a little. These are arrows, sir, he announced, holding one up for inspection. Dame Fitzooth smiled upon the boy as she rose to meet her lord. What fortune do you bring us today, father? asked she, cheerily. Fitzooth's face was a mask of discontent. I bring myself, dame, answered he, neither more nor less. Surely that is enough for Robin and me, laughed his wife. Come, cast off your shoes, and give me your bow and quiver. I have news for you, Hugh, even if you have none for us. George of Gainwell has sent his messenger today, and bids me bring Robin to him for the fair. She hesitated to give the whole truth. That cannot be, began the ranger hastily, then checked himself. What wind is it that blows our squire's friendship towards me, I wonder? He went on, do we owe him at all? You are not fair to George Montfichet, Hugh. He is an open, honest man, and he is my brother. The dame spoke with spirit, being vexed that her husband would thus slight her item of news. That Montfichet is of Norman blood is sufficient to turn your thoughts of him as sour as old milk. I am as good as all the Montfichets and de Verays hereabout, dame, for all I am but plain Saxon, returned Fitzooth crossly, and the day may come when they shall know it. Athelstein the Saxon may make full as good a king, when Henry dies, as Richard of Aquitaine, with his hair-brained notions and rugged up religion. There would be bobbing of heads and curtsying to us then, if you like. Squire George of Gamewell would be sending messengers for me cap in hand, doubt it not. For that matter, there is ready welcome for you now at my brother's house, said Mistress Fitzooth, repenting of her sharpness at once. Montfichet bade us all to Gamewell, but here is his scroll, and you may read it for yourself. She took a scroll from her bosom as she spoke and offered it to her husband. He returned to the open door that he might read it. His brow puckered itself as he strove to decipher the flourish Norman writing. I have no leisure now for this screed, mother. Read it to me later, and you will. His tone was kinder again, for he saw how Robin had been busying himself in these last few moments. Let us up, mother. I dare swear we are all hungry after the heat of the day. I have made and tipped a full score of arrows, sir. Will you see them? asked Robin. That I will, so soon as I have found the bottom of this pasty. Sit yourselves, mother and Robin and will chatter afterwards. Robin helped his mother to kindle the flax whereby the dim and flickering tapers might be lighted. His fingers were more deft in this business, it would seem, than in the making of arrows. Fitzooth, in the intervals of his eating, took up Robin's arrows one by one, and had some shrewd jive ready for most of them. Of the score, only five were allowed to pass. The rest were tossed contemptuously into the black hearth, onto the little heap of smoldering fire. By my heart, Robin, but I shall never make a proper bowman of you. Were ever such shafts fashioned to fit across the cord and you. The arrows are pretty enough, Hugh, interposed the dame. There it is, cried Fitzooth triumphantly. The true bowman's hand showeth not in the prettiness of the arrow, mother, but in the straightness and hardness of the wand. Our Robin can fly a shaft right well, I grant you, and I have no question for his skill, but he cannot yet make me an arrow such as I love. Well, I do think them right handsomely done, said Mistress Fitzooth, unconvinced. It is not given to every one to make such arrows as you can, husband, but my Robin has other accomplishments. He can play upon the harp sweetly and sing you a good song. Fitzooth must still grumble, however. I would rather your fingers should bend the bow than pluck at harp strings, Robin, growled he. Still, there is time for all things. Read me now our brother's message. Robin, eager to atone for the faults of his arrows, stretched out the paper upon the table and read aloud the following. From George Accord Montfichet of the Hall of Gamewell, near Nottingham, squire of the hundreds of Sandwell and Sherwood, giving greetings and praying God's blessing on his sister Eleanor, and on her husband, Master Hugh Fitzooth, ranger of the King's Forest at Locksley. Happiness be with you all. I do make you this creed in the desire that you will both of you ride to me at Gamewell, in the light of morning, the fifth day of June, bringing with you our young kinsman Robin. There is a fair toward at Nottingham for three days this week, and we are expecting great and astonishing marvels to be performed at it. Wherefore, seeing that it will doubtless give him satisfaction and some knowledge, for who can witness wonders without being the wiser for them, fail not to present yourselves as I honestly wish. I shall ask that Robin shall stay with me for the space of one year at least, 
having no son now, and being a lonely man. Him will I treat as my own child in all ways, and return him to you in the June of next year. This I send by the hand of Warrington, my man-at-arms, who shall bear me your reply. Given under our hand at Gamewell, the fourth day of June, in the year of grace, one thousand, one hundred, and eighty-eight. Signed, Montfichet. Robin's clear voice ceased, and silence fell upon them all. Fitzsooth guessed that both his son and wife waited anxiously for his decision. Yet he had so great a pride that he could not at once agree to the courteous invitation. For himself he had no doubt. Nothing would move Fitzsooth to mix with the fine folk of Nottingham, whilst his claims to the acres of Broadwheel, in Lancashire, went unrecognized. It was an old story, and although, by virtue of his office as ranger at Locksley, Hugh Fitzsooth might very properly claim an honorable position in the county, he swore not to avail himself of it unless he could have a better one. The bar sinister stayed him from Broadwheel, so the judges had said, and haughty Fitzsooth had henceforth to bear with their finding. The king had been much interested in the suit, the estate being a large one, situated in the country palatine of England, and the matter had caused some stir in the court. When Fitzsooth had failed, Henry, anxious to find favor in his Saxon subjects, had bestowed on him the keeping of a part of the forest of Sherwood, in Nottingham. So Fitzsooth, plain master now for good and I, had come to Locksley, a little village at the further side of the forest, and had taken up the easy duties allotted to him. Here he had nursed his pride in loneliness for some years, then had met one day Eleanor Montfichet, a hunting in the woods. He had unbent to her, and she gave him her simple true heart. Strange pair, thrown together by fate, in sooth, yet no man could say that this was an unhappy union. Within a year there came black-eyed Robin to them, and they worshipped their child. But as time passed, and Hugh's claims were again put aside, his nature began to go sour once more. Now there were lonely, unfriendly folk, with no society other than that of a worthy clerk of Coppenhurst, a hermit too. He had taught Robin his Latin grace, and had given him a fair knowledge of Norman, Saxon, and the middle tongues. "'Say we may all go tomorrow, father,' cried Robin, breaking the silence. "'I have never seen Nottingham Fair, sir, and you have promised to take me often.' "'I cannot leave this place, for there is my work, and robbers are to be found even here. I have to post my foresters each day in their tasks, and see that the deer are not killed or stolen.' He paused, and then, noting the disappointment in his son's face, relented. Yet, since there is the fair, and I have promised it, Robin, you shall go with your mother to Gamewell, if so be the friar of Coppenhurst can go also. So get ready your clothes, for I know that you would wish to be at your best in our brother's hall. I will speed you tomorrow as far as Coppenhurst, and will send two hinds to serve you to Nottingham Gates. Warrington, my brother's man, spoke grievously of the outlaw bands near Gamewell, and told how he had to journey warily. So spoke Mistress Fitzooth trying yet to bring her husband to say that he too would go. The sheriff administers his portion of the forest very indomitably then, returned Fitzooth. We have no fears and whinings here, but I do not doubt that Warrington chattered with a view to test our courage, or perchance to make more certain of my refusal. But we are to go, are we not, sir? Robin was anxious again, for his father's tone had already changed. I have said it, and there it ends, said Fitzooth shortly. If the clerk will make the journey, you shall make it too. Further, and the squire will have you, you shall stay at Gamewell, and learn the tricks and prettiness of court and town. But look to your bow for use in life, and to your hands and eyes for help. Kiss me, Robin, and get to bed. Learn all you can, and if Warrington can show you how to fashion arrows within the year, I'll ask no more of Brother George of Gamewell. You shall be proud of me, sir, I swear it. But I shall not stay longer than a month, for I am to watch over Mother's garden. Never will shafts such as yours find quarry, Robin. I think that they would sooner kill the archer than the birds. There, mind not my jesting. Men shall talk of you, and I may live to hear them. Be just always, and be honest. The day broke clear and sweet. From Locksley to the borders of Sherwood Forest was but a stone's cast. Robin was in high glee, and had been awake long ere daylight. He had dressed himself in his best doublet, green trunk hose, and pointed shoes, and had strung and unstrung his bow full a score of times. A sumpter mule had been saddled to carry the baggage, for the dame had, at the last moment, discovered a wondrous assortment of fineries and fripperies that most perforce be translated to Gamewell. Robin was caroling like any bird. "'Are you glad to be leaving Locksley, my son?' asked Hugh Fitzooth. "'Aye, rarely. "'Tis a dull place, no doubt. "'And glad to be leaving home, too? "'No, sir, only happy at the thought of the fair. "'Doubt it not that I shall be returned to you long ere a month is gone. "'A year, Robin, a year. Twelve changing months ere you will see me again. "'I have given my word now. Keep me a place in your heart, Robin. You shall have it all now, sir, be sure. And I am not really so glad within as I seem without. 
Tut, I am not chiding you. Get you upon your Janet, dame. And Robin, do you show the way. Roderick and the other shall lead the baggage mule. Have you pikes with you, men? And full sheaths? I have brought me a dagger, father, cried Robin joyfully. So, bravely they set forth from their quiet home at Loxley, and came within an hour to Coppenhurst. Here only were the ruins of the chapel, and the clerk's hermitage, a rude stowed building of two small rooms. Enclosed with high oaken stakes, and well guarded by two gaunt hounds, was the humble abode of the anchorite. The clerk came to the verge of his enclosure to greet them, and stood peering above the palisades. "'Give you good morrow, father,' cried Robin. "'Get your steed and tie up the dogs. We go to Nottingham this day, and you are to come with us.' The monk shook his head. "'I may not leave this spot, child, for matters of vanity,' he answered in would-be solemn tones. "'Will you not ride with the dame and my son, father?' asked Fitzooth. "'George of Gamewell has sent in for Robin, and I wish that you should journey with him, giving him such sage counsel as may fit him for a year's service in the great and worshipful company that he may now meet. "'Come with us to-day, father,' urged Mistress Fitzooth also. "'I have brought a veal pasty and some bread, so that we may not be hungry on the road. Also there is a flask of wine. "'Nay, daughter, I have no thought for the carnal things of life. I will go with you, since the ranger of Loxley orders it. It is my place to obey him whom the king has put in charge of our Greenwood. Bide here whilst I make brief preparation. His eyes had twinkled, though, when the dame had spoken, and one could see that twas not on roots and fresh water alone that the clerk had thrived. Full and round were the lines of him under his monthly gown, and his face was red as any harvest moon. You bade farewell briefly to them, whilst the clerk was tying up his hounds and chattering with them. When the clerk was ready, Fitzooth kissed his dame, and bade her be firm with her son, then embracing Robin, ordered him to protect his mother from all mischance. Also he was to bear himself honorably and quietly, and, whilst being courteous to all folk, he was not to give way unduly to anyone who should attempt to browbeat or to cousin him. Remember also that your father is a proud man, and see, take those arrows of my own making, and learn from them how to trim the hazel. You have a steady hand and bold eye. Be a craftsman when you return to Loxley and I will give you control of some part of the forest under me. Now, farewell. Take my greetings to our brother Gamewell. Then the king's forester turned on his heel and strode back towards Loxley. Once he paused and faced about to wave his cap to them. Then his figure vanished into the green of the trees. A sadness fell upon Robin, unaccountably perplexing. But the hermit soberly journeyed towards Nottingham, the two men at arms, with Sumter Mule riding in front. The road wound in and about the forest, and at noon they came to a park where the trees nigh shut out the sky. Robin spied out a fine old stag, and his fingers itched to fit one of his new arrows to his bow. These be all of the king's dear, father? he asked the friar, thoughtfully. Every beast within Sherwood, royal or mean, belongs to our king, child. Do they not say that Henry is away in a foreign land, father? Aye, but he will return. His deer are not yet to be slain by your arrows, child. When you are rangely at Loxley, in your father's stead, who shall then say you nay? My father should not shoot the king's deer, except those past their time, answered Robin quickly. He tends them, and slays instead any robbers who would maltreat or kill the does. Do you think I could hit yon beast, father? He makes a pretty mark, and my arrow would but prick him. The clerk glanced towards Mistress Fitzooth. Dame, he said gravely, do you not think that here, in the school shadow, we might well stay our traveling? Sure it is near the hour of noon, and, here he sank his voice to a sly whisper, it would be well, perhaps, to let this temptation pass away from before our Robin. Else, I doubt not, the king will be one stag the less in Sherwood. I like none this dark road, father, began the dame. We shall surely come to a brighter place. Robin, do you ride near us, and let your bow be at rest. Warrington, your uncle's man, told me, but yesterday... Her voice was suddenly drowned in the noise of a horn, wound so shrilly and distantly as to cause them all to start. Then, in a moment, half a score of lusty rascals appeared, springing out of the earth almost. The men-at-arms were seized, and the little cavalcade brought to a rude halt. Toll, toll, called out the leader. Toll must you pay, every one, ere your journey be continued. Forbear, cried Robin, waving his dagger as soon as the man made attempt to take his mother's genet by the bridle. Tell me the toll and the reason for it, and be more mannerly. The man just then spied the great stag which Robin had longed to shoot, bounding away to the left of them. Swiftly he slipped an arrow across his longbow and winged it after the flying beast. A miss, an easy miss, called Robin impatiently. Dropping his dagger, he snatched up an arrow from his quiver, fitted it to his bow, and sent it speeding towards the stag. Had I but aimed sooner, murmured Robin, regretfully, when his arrow failed by a yard to reach its quarry, and the clerk held up his hands in pious horror of his words. The shot was a long one, young master, spoke the robber, and he stooped to pick up Robin's little weapon. Here is your bodkin. Tis no fault of yours that the arrow was not true. They all laughed right merrily, but Robin was vexed. 
Stand away, fellows, said he, and let us pass on. I'll show you all be whipped. Again the leader of the band spoke. Toll first, lording. Tender it prettily to us, and you shall only tender it once. I'll tender it not at all, retorted young Fitzsooth. Fie upon you for staying a woman upon the king's high road. Pretty men, forsooth, to attack in so cowardly a fashion. All must buy freedom of the greenwood, master, answered the man quite civilly. We who exact the toll, take no heed of sex. Pay us now, and when you return there shall be no questioning. A woman should be a safe convoy and free from all toll, argued Robin. Now here are my two men. Slaves, master, and they have only your mule and the two pipes. It is not enough. You will leave us nothing then, it seems, said Dame Fitzsooth, in trembling but brave voice. There is one thing that we all do value, mistress, and I propose bearing you that. We will do no one of you any bodily harm. Take my purse, then, sighed Mistress Fitzsooth. There is little enough in it, for we are poor folk. Ask toll of the church, cried Robin, staying his mother. The church is rich and has to spare, and afterwards she can grant absolution to you all. Again the robbers laughed, as the clerk began explaining very voluble to them that they were welcome to all that Mother Church could on this occasion offer. We know better than to stay a monk for toll, said the robber. Besides, would your excellence have us commit sacrilege? I would have you leave hold of my bridle, answered Robin, very wrathfully. Pay the toll cheerfully, youngling, cried one of the others, and be not so wordy in the business. We have other folk to visit. The day is already half gone from Sherwood. I will shoot with you for the freedom of the forest, said Robin desperately, and I lose, then shall you take all but my mother's jennet. She shall be allowed to carry my mother into Gamewell, whilst I remain here as hostage for her return. Let the dame bring back a hundred crowns in each of her hands, then, replied the chief of the robbers. It is agreed, answered Robin, after one appealing glance towards the dame. Now help me down from my horse, and let the clerk see fair play. Set us a mark, good father, and pray heaven to speed my arrows cunningly. The clerk, who had kept himself much in the background, now spoke. This wager seems to savor of unholiness, my friends, said he solemnly. Yet, in it it also smacks of manliness. I will even consent to be judge. You, sir, since you are doubtless well acquainted with the part, can speak for distance. Now I do appoint the trunk of yon birch tree as the first mark in this business. Speed your arrow, then, lording, laughed the robber gaily. Tis but forty ells away. I will follow you respectfully, never doubt it. Robin bent his bow and trained his eyes upon the birch. Then suddenly came back upon him his father's words. Remember that I am a proud man, Robin. I will, muttered Robin, betwixt set teeth, and he aimed with all his heart and soul in it. There came the twang of the bowstring, and the next moment the goose shaft was flying towards its mark. A pretty shot, master, said the robber, glancing carelessly towards the arrow, quivering still in the trunk of the birch tree. But you have scarce taken the center of our mark. Let me see if I may not mend your aim. His arrow sang through the summer air, and took root fairly in the middle of the trunk, side by side with Robin's. You win first round, friend, said the clerk, with seeming reluctance. Now listen, both, whilst I make you a better test. He was about to continue, when an interruption occurred, one that saved him necessity of further speech. End of chapter 1 Recording by Todd